Are you going to have agents who ask you, what? Where's compensation in the MLS? It just disappeared. Or are you preparing them to understand the changes and to be ready for them from the NAR settlement? Today's guest, Leo Pareja, is the new CEO of EXP Realty, and he went into detail about what they're doing with preparing their agents on buyer consultations, buyer agreements, explaining them. There's a ton of confusion around what it actually means, and they're trying to break through the noise and really give their their agents and team leaders some great advice in, in preparing agents for this. We also talked about the market and how your mindset as an agent and broker goes a long way towards success and how, you know, it's easy to look at everything that's wrong with the market today, but there are a lot of positives and he'll go into some of that as well. So enjoy the podcast. So Leo, welcome to the Real Trending Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Tracy. Yeah. Um, well, congratulations on being named CEO of EXP Realty. That's super exciting. Um, so you haven't been in that position very long, but I, I wanted to just kind of start out with what do you feel like your primary focus will be this um, the rest for the rest of the year and going into 2025? Yeah, so it, it's it's super simple for me. It's It's guiding us through the transition, right? Come mid-July, I think a lot of our agents are going to go through, well, all the agents are going to go through a, a way of doing business that's not familiar to them. Um, everything in real estate, uh, I say, is customary, right? So we're used to doing certain things in a certain way. And so we are all going to go through a great transition on how we treat um, consumers. And actually, I'm wearing a shirt because I have been agent-facing all day. And uh, if, if you watched my live on March 15th, 18th, I said, I'm going to get a shirt made. And actually one of the agents watching sent me a shirt. So it says, treat your buyers like you treat your sellers. And so it's, 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 it's a paradigm shift for us as agents. And so my focus will be tactical and operational, you know, creating buyer presentations, creating scripts, creating, uh, the, the, the kind of pathway from a cold lead to a warm lead to getting them fully signed up for full representation. Uh, we've rolled out a one-page buyer representation agreement for one property. So not to dive into any of those unless that's where you want to take the conversation. I would say my immediate focus for the year is is holding our agent's hand, making sure they understand that they're fully supported, and, and, and guiding them through it, right? When, when I'm asked to predict where the industry goes post-change, I say, well, in two or five years, it's easy. It's a new normal, whatever that looks like. It's this messy middle between here and there that I'm most focused on making sure our agents feel uh, that we have their back. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, at the gathering, we had a panel of um, some brokers talking about the transition. And one of them said, don't be surprised if some of your agents are like, wait, where's the commission in the MLS? <laughs> um, and, uh, and are surprised that compensation is no longer in there, no matter how much you tell them. <laughs> I actually uh, gave a keynote last week and I said it even more specific. I said in August, remember this moment, because an audience of highly productive team leaders. I said there will be someone losing their mind at the settlement table when they see that there is nothing on their side of the HUD one, right? So, um, you know, it, you, you and I are kind of contemplating how could that be possible, but it will happen, right? Because right now there are properties in the MLSs offering a compensation and there will be a trigger point where Everything that was previously listed won't have it, will have it, and the ones that won't, and, and there's going to be a, a, an adjustment period. Yeah, I think it's been confusing in general for people, um, you know, for agents, and, uh, you know, because nothing, it's still, even though there are things going into effect in July or mid-July, nothing has actually been a final there's no final settlement. There might be changes to what that buyer representation agreement looks like. There could be, you know, so it's hard to be very specific other, you know, um, with with what they have to do once this is final. You kind of have a guideline of what it's going to be, but details aren't always there. Couldn't agree with you more, right? Yeah. And, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, once it's localized, you know, overlaying uh, county or state jurisdiction, uh, current rulings, it may feel different in different parts of the country. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know there are some parts of the country that are already used to this. I know Michigan, I believe, is one that um, they sign their, you know, agents work with buyers and have them sign representation agreements um, all the time. I don't know if it's required by the state or if it's yeah, just so, something. Yeah, so the, the three states that I know off the top of my head that have pretty strict representation rules are the state of Washington, North Carolina, and Georgia. But where, where I think agents kind of get confused, and I talk about it all the time with them, is buyer agency disclosure versus an actual buyer representation. Because one is a disclosure that is a one-directional um, the CYA versus one is a two-party employment contract with compensation and termination dates in foot. And so I, I think in the vast majority of the country, agents have kind of relied on implied representation through procuring calls and not, not actually gone through the, did you sit down with a buyer? Did you do a full presentation? Did you stick a contract in front of their face? Stating, because like with no changes to any of the rulings, a true buyer agency representation agreement says I will earn X. And in most of the paragraphs that I've read state, if you know, if, if, if it's different than what's on the MLS, it's owned by the seller or by the, or by the consumer. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm in Florida. We're a transaction brokerage, brokerage state. Um, and the question I had was, well, wait, so if you have to sign a buyer agreement now, does that mean it's no longer presumed transaction brokerage and all buyer agents are going to be representing a buyer? And that is not true. You can still sign one and be a transaction broker. So it's going to be confusing for sure for people. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's a whole nother subject as to, you know, I, I would advise people not to do a dual agency and just, you know, depending on if it's their listing to just be very clear if they're being a transaction or, a, you know, minister lacks what, whatever state you, you are in. But again, um, you know, as the broker, we're, we're also not dictating how people run their businesses. And again, with compensation and business models, I'm not sure if that's, we're going to touch on that. Like I see our job as being the platform that supports your business as an entrepreneur and making sure you have all the tools in, in order to be able to provide the services you're attempting to provide. Absolutely. Well, I want to talk because, um, you know, EXP Realty is number one in transaction sides and number three in volume in the Real Trends Verified um, brokerage rankings this year. So congratulations on that. It's a huge accomplishment. Um, I know that the company has grown tremendously in a very quick um, amount of time, which um, Glenn should be commended for, for sure. But like, how are you going to, I asked Glenn this question too. So uh, in our, our interview at the gathering, but how are you going to maintain that momentum? How are you going to keep it going and um, continue to grow? Yeah, no, I, I love that question and I love th th those stats, right? Um, I, I think for a very long time, um, I, again, the, the model Glenn built was very bottoms up. And I think that was the, kind of the brilliance in what he did where he allowed these leaders to to come up with their own value proposition and attract them to the platform. And, and, and the outcome of that is we have the most productive teams in the country and in the world on our platform. So if you take our top 250 teams that we just... Uh, identified and announced and add the to just the transactions of those top 250 teams, they would have been ranked number six on your list, right behind Howard Hanna, 69,000 plus transactions in just 250 teams. So what that tells me is we are, we're super attractive to, to real business owners in whether it's, you know, multi-market across county lines or even across state lines, there's just no other kind of, you know, legacy traditional model that supports that. And so one of the things I'm, I'm constantly obsessed with is creating value that's unreplicatable and unique. So I, I was a very productive team leader. And, you know, as we jumped on here, I remember, I think our first conversation was probably back in 2010 when I was the number one KW agent in the country on sides. And what, what I always looked for was that unique, you know, masterminding and collaboration that, uh, how do I, you know, when, when you're in that kind of upper echelon of production, um, it, you, you're looking for that next technique or concept that can either help you grow your team, help you uh, maximize margin, right? And so I'm harnessing kind of the brilliance of the cohort and the tribe to, to pour into each other. And one of the coolest things uh, that we have not been highlighting enough that I'm very focused on is showing, you know, how proximity is power. And I have example after example. There was an agent 
in Northern California. His name is Jeremy Larson, who had been licensed 10 plus years, had been coached by multiple coaching organizations, joined us, did $9 million uh, in production, went to $30 million as a solo producer, went to $100 million in his first year as a team leader, went to $200 million in his second year as a team leader. And in, in, in I, I you know, spend time talking to agents frontline, and they say being around the most productive agents allow you to kind of learn by osmosis and compress time. So my answer to your question is, you know, I think success attracts success. And the more of those top business minds we have, we can attract other ones who are looking to grow in that capacity. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm less focused on agent count as I am by the most productive agents who are thinking outside the box and going into the shift we're going to go into. None of us know what's actually going to happen. I, we don't know if someone's going to invent a new process of doing things or a new business model idea that scales. But what I do know is as, as long as it's legal and ethical within the rules of the, 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 the changes, we're here to support agents and allow them to explore and experiment. Um, I'm sure that there's going to be lots of attempts. And then two, three, four years from now, we, the, the, the market will tell us what is, you know, the most consumer friendly and, and, and win-win for the consumers and the agents that represent them. Yeah, absolutely. And we touched on this a little bit before, but um, with the challenges and, and all of the changes coming down from the NAR settlement. But there's also a market that is, I mean, we're seeing some increases in inventory. I think Texas and Florida have um, had a bigger increase than most other states. Um, but the market has just kind of been limping along with high interest rates and people maybe are starting to get used to that. But what strategies are you implementing um, at EXP to kind of help the agents and teams navigate all of these market challenges as well as the other? So this is my favorite word in the English language. And it, it, first of all, it's a constant reminder that you you need to give yourself some grace. And, you know, I love numbers and I feel like numbers and data set you free, right? If 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 And if you become a student of your own path, like if, if you're an agent, you've been licensed for five years, what do you, whatever you did in 2020 and 2021 is going to be very different than what you did in 2023, 2022 and 2023. And when you put it in context that 2023 was the lowest year since like 1995, lower than 2008 with transaction count. And that's sort of like year, a year side by side year comparison. Someone actually pointed out to me the other day, that's, that's not taking into effect household formation and population growth between 1995 and 2024. So that, that 4 million is probably closer to like three and a half or something with, with the available, you know, amount of humans. So what I say to people is, look, let's, let's just look at year over year. Let's say you were down between 2022 and 2023, 10%, but the market actually fell 45% in some parts of the country from a transaction unit count. So you actually outperformed the market by like 20%. And so my, my constant conversation is, First of all, understand that um, there is less pie to go around. And, and the good news is, you know, if you get through this market cycle, so one thing I always say is this too shall pass and, and remind people that if you, if you survive this, you actually expanded your market share. And that's what we're seeing year over year. We, we could still like from 2022 to 2023, our total transaction count was down, but our total share of homes transacting in America went up, right? So I, I encourage, and, and I have agents winning year over year, like 100 to 110 transactions, uh, which which means they really crushed it because then they outperformed it by like 30%. So um, this too shall pass. Have context in your market, right? So like if, know how many transactions you did and, and see if there's a percentage increase because because that, that will just, it allow you to give yourself grace. Um, and I encourage agents to have lots of conversations in and outside of their brokerage. Because when you remember that everyone is kind of struggling, it, it it probably takes some pressure off yourself where you're probably beating yourself up. Um, but then then I always go to the fact that residential real estate is a essential service, right? We learned that during the pandemic more than academically. And the reality is 4 million is about the, the low end of transactions 
in any given year if we go, look over a 50 year period. Seven million is the high end of that, and it happened in 06, happened in 2021. And, and you know, at the crux of the NAR plaintiff complaint is that they're trying to reduce the cost of housing. I'll go on record to say I don't think it's going to change one bit on the affordability. Uh, because affordability, in my opinion, is a math problem between household formation, the amount of humans that create demand, okay. the financing cost, right? The cost of financing and the amount of supply available in the market. And uh, we are mathematically short houses that all came from the Great Recession in 20, 2008 onward. We did not build enough homes. So depending on the economists, we're short 5 million to 15 million homes. So let's just split the baby at 10 million homes. So we're going to be in a low inventory environment for the significant future. I don't see interest rates coming down, but I always remind people that this is all human condition driven, right? We fall in love. We make little people. We may, we need more space, less space, and a couple promotional loans all along the way. Death and divorce dictate almost all residential moves, right? Nobody wakes up and says interest rates are 2.85%. I need to move today. It's like, we need a, we need a second bedroom. We need a third bedroom. We don't need a second or third bedroom and we need less space or unfortunately, you know, some, someone leaves us, uh, physically or, 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 or to the, to the next realm and you need to, to, to sell your property. So what I'm telling people is focus on the sellers that need to move, right? I would, I would not be focused on the want to move, but the need to move. One strategy that I'm employing with everybody, especially with the, with the high interest rate environments is we know that the economy is tightening up. So I'm, I'm encouraging everybody to make their calls and stay in touch with people, even though they put in homes one or two or three years ago, that would not be, uh, you know, your, your expected seller to be in trouble because I think there's going to be some level of distress that won't manifest like 08, where it was mad, massive amounts of, uh, dis you know, foreclosed properties. I think the distress wave we'll see is retail real estate where someone is falling behind on their mortgage and they're probably just letting their lender know they're going to list the property because they're equity rich, right? So um, I, I, I've always lived with a philosophy of, you know, life is 10% of what happens and 90% how you react to it, right? So I think you constantly need to say, hey, do I want to stay in this industry and, 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 and operate under the new rules of the market, whether it's changes, rule changes to interest rates, to inventory, and if the answer is yes, I think you just kind of look around and survey what the, who are the customers you can serve and offer them the best quality service you can. Yeah, absolutely. And I will go on record as agreeing with you about prices. I think it's a supply and demand issue and not um, commission related. So, so yeah. Um, so you obviously, you know, EXP came into the, into the market with a virtual model. You have some competition now, but, um, and COVID helped that competition some because people moved to a more virtual, virtual world as well, helped you as well. So people who didn't think they could do it decided, you know what, I can do this. Um, but how do you see your model kind of evolving under your leadership? Any enhancements that you anticipate or, um, you know, new innovation? Yeah, so at our core, we are a real estate brokerage, and, and I don't forget that by any stretch of the imagination. I think we probably have more uh, leaders and leadership who either are technologists or brand software companies than other companies, but I don't forget that at our core, it's it's a real estate brokerage. So I would say my, my first focus when I joined the company, because even though I'm CEO, I'm not new to the leadership team, uh, was all around operational excellence, right? At the end of the day, I want to make sure I pay you faster than anybody else. I onboard you faster. There is a frictionless experience. You know, I'm I'm on my Apple laptop with my AirPods and my phone and my watch are sitting on my Apple charger in front of me. And it's not that I'm a Steve Jobs fanboy. It's the fact that the experience is frictionless. My contacts transfer. I can pick one phone call or text or WhatsApp all seamlessly, seamlessly across multiple platforms. And so my obsession in one sentence is I want to make being an EXP better than not being an EXP. So that goes from, you know, paying you virtually instantly at the time of settlement because I can, you know, image the 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 settlement statement and and advance the money that moment, um, to making sure that we have twenty four seven, seven day a week one first first level support, um, 
for any country, we can follow the sun because we're 24 countries from a support standpoint. You know, I, 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 I've always operated from a sample size of one. And I think as business people, we, we tend to forget how powerful that is. Um, I, I like to joke that, you know, one, one thing is super clear to me is I'm remarkably average, 5'11", have a beard, 185 pounds, and there's probably 80 million other American men who, who, who fit that criteria. And so if I disagree or don't like something in a service, like I hate calling in somewhere and being put on hold and being transferred five times. So like at, at the core of it, it's like, are you excellent at your core competency is step one. Because at the end of the day, we are a platform that supports very um, independent entrepreneurs, right? At the end of the day, agents are the brand. They like their own processes. And, 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 and uh, you know, you can't forget that we, sold, or we serve multiple avatars in this business, right? I have just as many, uh, you know, I, I went on a rant about my top teams, but you know, the, the vast concentration of my agents are solo producers that have a phenomenal, you know, solo practice where they're serving anywhere between five to 20 consumers per year. And so I got to make sure that we have services and tools that apply to everybody. But, you know, staying in the forefront, um, you know, I, I've been hearing that technology was going to put us out of business since I got licensed at 22. And what I will say is the agents that adopt technology and forward facing trains are the ones that put the ones that don't out of business. So, you know, when I, when I was a principal broker in my 20s at KW, I actually remember debating an agent on whether she should get an email address because she said the facts in the way in line worked fine. So I think that, uh, you know, we will continue to be pushing the envelope with AI and generative language models and how we can automate processes or create more support. You know, chat GPT is you know, something I use on a daily basis now. Um, and so I, I think we will continue to, to, to push on the limits of where we can augment, but at the same time, never forget that we're a real estate company and we're here to provide, you know, that backend support to allow these entrepreneurs to build what it is they want to build. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's talk about long-term growth vision. Um, I know at the gathering, Glenn mentioned some international expansion, um, talk to me a little bit about your growth path. I know you said that you focus on production. Um, it's not necessarily about age and count. Um, so expand on that a little bit. Yeah. So, so, and again, it's mostly around this moment, right? Where, you know, we are seeing, um, you know, uh, fact check this one if I, if I say it incorrectly, but I, I think I saw an NAR stat where like 57% of agents sold zero homes last year, you know, which, which is not too far from any other year, but it was higher than in Norman. And so the, the real estate industry is highly aspirational, right? We have lots of folks who come as a second or third career. And I, I always laugh because they come for the things that if you are successful, you never get to actually have, which is flexibility and <laughs> lots of time. And, you know, the most productive agents uh, are probably the most um, disciplined humans I've ever met. Um, and so, you know, there, there is a high level of aspiration and it, and it translates directly into like the, the, the larger churn metrics that we see, like 66% of the agents don't make it past year one and by year five, 90% of them are not going. Um, and so I think that's always part of, part of the, the, the industry. Uh, but, you know, when we look at the, the globe as the entire map, you know, that does give us a ton of green shoots for growth. And I'm, I'm quite bullish on that. And, you know, I, I would say that even in the time I've been in real estate, uh, the, you know, when I when I entered the business, I think the top teams in the country were doing 200 deals a year, 250 deals a year, and that blew my mind. Right now, we have teams doing thousands of transactions per per year, and so, and I think that's attributed to technology. I think that we can create, you know, lead gen funnels that um, jump county lines and state lines, um, and. If you have a very niche down business, like our top agent last year, she does uh, short-term rentals and long-term rentals. She's in 21 active markets with 68 agents. Um, and so th this new world, this brave new world, I think allows you to cross borders. And I, I fully expect to see, you know, agents crossing country lines, right? So I live in South Florida and we have a phenomenal group of EXP agents. And a lot of them will just do pre-construction and 
a lot of their customers come from overseas, right? And we've opened in country. You know, I, I think we're seeing more world cities like Miami and Dubai and New used to once upon a time just kind of be New York and London, right? But I, I think we're seeing these emergence of, you know, multi-residency um, and crossing country lines. So uh, I get excited about the the opportunities for growth we have overseas. Yeah, I, we're Florida neighbors. So little, very different uh, areas, but... <laughs> I, I, well, yeah, Miami-Dade County, is it's, it's its own place. <laughs> Definitely. A lot of fun, too. Um, so I want to talk about like some of your previous roles and what are some of the lessons learned that you're bringing to your role as a CEO? I, I think lots. I, I think um, I'm, I'm grateful to have this role after having lots of successes, but mostly the failures, right? So I, I think um, the leadership lessons I've learned is to, to make sure that you are um, as forward facing as possible and as in the field as possible. So I, I'll tell you right now, over half my days are speaking to both agents and staff that would probably not expect to be sitting down with me picking me picking their brain about where it works and what doesn't. I think um, at the end of the day, there's there's no better feedback loop than than just honest conversations. And and you know, a lot of times the conversations start with them telling me that they're excited to be on the call with me, but I then have to kind of pull it out. It's like, well, what what if you were me, what could you change? Um, and so I, I'm up kind of obsessed with how a people are wired and also communication styles. And so just making sure that there's as much open communication and there's a lot of respect there. And, you know, I, we all do this, uh, not because it's our most fun thing to do it. We do it to provide for our families and our loved ones. So I, I always want to make sure that people understand it's like, look, you should never be, uh, uncomfortable to have these conversations. And in, in, in the context of, internally for staff it's also to understand the moment in the market we're in right just be I, I think the agents probably have a better understanding of the market sentiment than probably some of the uh, employees on the operations team and the other kind of more transactional parts of the business that may not be in tune with market sentiment right agents are forward-facing and they can they can hear a buyer say they're not qualifying because rates are over seven again Right versus someone who 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 is in in the kind of transaction workflow may not have that context of oh it's it's slowing down again because rates went back up instead of went back down. Yeah, definitely. So my last question to you is: What are some emerging trends you're seeing out there that real estate professionals should be paying attention to? Um, the ones that I'm I'm always encouraging people to do is to get outside of their comfort zone and test things. Right, so. Um, Right now, the one that I would obsess with is just, you know, the opportunities that AI are bringing, but also, but also caveat it with three years ago, how everything we were talking about was blockchain, right? How everything was going to be on the blockchain. So um, I, I like to interact with practitioners and follow trends. So like, I'll give you guys a, a very real one. Uh, before the call started, Tracy, I, 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 I shared that the guy was drilling in my bathroom. I actually um, designed the vanity that's going in my master bath with ChatGPT. I couldn't find a picture online that fit because it was it's kind of a small space, but I wanted a makeup counter in the middle with a his and her vanity and then some storage space on both sides. Uh, and I could not find anything to show the contractor that custom built it. Uh, but I wrote a very detailed prompt. It took me like five or six prompts, but I, you know, I was like 112 inches. I want the middle cabinet to be this. And I, it generated an image that I handed to my contractor he measured it, and I have a custom cabinet being delivered in two weeks that I designed between me and ChatGPT. And so that's a it's a very tactical way of testing, right? Like, I think some folks take stuff to an extreme. It's like, oh, one day we'll have a virtual everything that'll do that. Well, okay, maybe, but what can I do with it today, right? How can I become faster, stronger, better? Um, the, the concept that I always obsess with is compressing time. And so if, if something used to take me, like, Anytime I, I post anything to the internet, I throw it in chat GPT with the prompt that says, please correct for spelling and grammar, but do not change the tone, right? Because there's just little things where I don't want it to sound like a robot. It's just, you know, I'm ADD and probably a little dyslexic, so I just don't want to sound like I don't know what I'm, <laughs> I am can spell. But outside of that, I still want it to be in my voice. I don't I don't want it to, to sound like someone's ghostwriting for me. 
Yeah, actually, Glenn gave me some tips on prompts when um, we were at the gathering and explained how, you know, I could I could make one of my prompts better. And, and it did. It was amazing what it produced after that. So, so yeah. Well, I mean, I mean the funny thing is you, you can actually even ask it for tips with prompts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Um, well, Leah, thanks so much for joining the Real Trending podcast. We wish you um, much success in your role as CEO. And um, I have no doubt that EXP is going to continue to climb. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks, Leah.